recording? Can you see the screen? Um, uh, yes, perfect. Uh, okay, thank you very much uh, for joining me today. Andrada, unfortunately, uh, had a last minute issue at work, so she won't be able to join us. Um, however, uh, our talk about today is about local production, and uh, um, we have one of the brands in here uh, that we're going to speak of, um, about. So it will be uh, great to ask Prasen to join us at a certain point in the conversation, um, just to uh, always start uh, by introducing myself. I am Diana, uh, Diana Ganes. Andrada, uh, well, who's not here today, she is an expert in, uh, in, in innovation in the fashion industry and in sustainability. She works for Redemption. Um, and though we will be missing her a lot today, um, it's, uh, I'm going to introduce myself. I'm Diana Ganes. I work in the fashion industry. I've been working in the fashion industry for the past 10 years. And uh, since three years, I have a consulting firm and we're specialized in product innovation and design, more than anything for the footwear uh, industry. We are extremely speci specialized in sustainability and that's why we actually decided to make this talk. Um, initially, it's, uh, they are, they've been all a bit basic, I would say, which is not a bad thing necessarily, but uh, we've decided to start this way because uh, we see that there is a lot of like misconception of what sustainability means. Um, there's a microphone that is um, not, uh, that it's on, so I will actually ask you to mute all of them, please. Uh, okay, well, I just did it myself. Um, so, uh, if you have any questions or anything, please feel free to actually ask. In the meantime, you can um, write on the chat. Um, I am changing the slides. Sometimes I have problems when I change them that people don't see it. So right now we are at what is sustainability. If you are not seeing that slide, please let me know. Um, so just to start with what is sustainability, uh, sustainability is, um, I, we describe it as balance, respect, and transparency. Why? Because sustainability is not, at the moment, just or environmental, or social, or economical. A lot of people have that misconception of like, oh, I want to have a sustainable brand, and that sustainable brand to that person is just because it's, it's vegan, for example. And uh, that's doesn't mean necessarily that it is sustainable as it doesn't mean that it is not sustainable, okay? So balance in the sense that um, these three circles that we're seeing, social, environmental, economic, it's, we need a balance of those three uh, pillars in order to be considered sustainable, okay? So we can't be sustainable if we are paying super well all of our employees, but at the same time, we are um, contaminating the river or like on the side of the company, I don't know, like the disposal of chemicals. Or we can't be considered sustainable if we are not using leather, but we are using just, I don't know, like all of our uh, packaging is single use plastic, no? FYI, I'm not uh, against leather. So, um, and if anyone has questions, of course you can ask. Uh, but uh, just to understand that it's a matter of balance, of respect, respect towards human beings, towards nature. Also, it's an economical respect. We can't underpay or overpay if the infrastructure, if the company is, can't sustain itself, okay? And it's a matter of transparency. We need, we need to know, it should be more than normal to know, like, what is it? That we're doing and why are we doing it okay and so to like uh, summarize it there's, there's three pillars that are the most important uh, 
in order to be sustainable. Nowadays, there's no company that is 100% sustainable. That is just like a marketing thing when we say that something is 100% sustainable. Um, this whole thing about sustainability actually started like the boom in the fashion industry basically after 2013. That doesn't mean that there were not brands actually working on it, but since 2013 is that there's been a lot of, like they've been giving a lot of importance to that because after the Rana Plaza incident, that is uh, like in Bangladesh, there was this big uh, building and it crashed. There were a lot of factories operating there. A lot of people died, like 2,700 people. 3,500 people were injured. Um, most of them were women. Out of the women, more than 50% were underage. So it was a huge scandal. And after that, uh, actually fashion started paying much more attention to sustainability and uh, started following the sustainable development goals from the United Nations. And in here, we can actually see that it's not just a matter of leather, not leather, plastic, not plastic. It's the first one is no poverty. The, the second one is zero hunger. So sustainability is a matter of everything. And it's extremely important to take it into consideration when we speak about it. Uh, speaking about local production, which is the topic we're going to be uh, speaking about today. Um, we decided to uh, show you which are the sustainable development goals that go towards local production. So the eight, which is decent work and economic growth, okay? Um, that means that we are creating uh, job opportunities, that there's no informal employment or that we are reducing it. There is, um, I don't know where you're coming from, but there, it's very normal that uh, companies don't want to hire you or they want to give you a one month contract, three month contract, or, or tell you like, no, you can come, we pay you cash, you know? Um, so the idea is to avoid that also because when a person has a contract, then they have insurance or they can have, I don't know, loans, uh, even within like banks or organizations. Um, the gender pay gap, I feel very lucky. I've never had that problem. Uh, I know in Italy it's a terrible problem that women actually earn much less than men. Um, and safe and secure in, uh, working environment, which is, for example, what happened with uh, Rana Plaza, we can't have an infrastructure that will fall apart. We need to uh, take care of the people that are working with us. Then also for local production, uh, we are speaking about reduced inequality. And that is uh, because there are a lot of countries that have uh, wages that are much lower. And we're going to speak about that more towards the end when we speak about uh, grassroots innovation. Um, but the idea is that like the fashion industry has been taking a lot of advantages of these countries that have lower payments, but uh, and in the first world countries they're living in, they're actually doing all the opposite. Like their employees are super well paid, uh, they have all insurances, they have a perfect working condition. And in the other countries that are developing countries, they don't care about them. So uh, the like the fashion industry and the people, like important people in the industry are asking actually to extend those rights to the other developing countries. So this is reduced inequality, for example. And the 11th, which is sustainable cities and communities. And that is, uh, I would say, like one of the most uh, important about local production because um, we are, uh, there, there's a very big um, disproportion, okay? Uh, and there are cities with a lot of like people in the slums. That means that there's a lot of contamination, the disposal is terrible. Um, there's no education. So uh, the idea is also, uh, also to smooth that um, inequality. And uh, having said this, we can start speaking about local production. So um, in here I wrote, to sustain local communities and provide jobs opportunities while preserving the original traditions and the environment. Uh, local production is 
uh, I know that when we say local production, it sounds like, okay, anywhere you produce is local, and it's true. Uh, however, it is very important to take into consideration the tradition of the place, extremely important. Extremely important to understand, like, for example, if we're going to produce in a Muslim place, we can't tell them not to pray five times a day, because to them, that's part of their culture. It's extremely important for us to respect it. It's not that it's working hours and they can't pray. Or, for example, uh, I don't know, like, if we're going to work in Mexico with a Mayan woman, uh, they have their own looms and it's beautiful. So embracing that, Embracing that part of the culture is what we, it's when we actually speak about local production. And there is this beautiful um, quote from Taisaku Ikeda, which is a Japanese philosopher. He's still alive, 92 years old. Uh, and he says, people can only live fully by helping others to live. When you give life to friends, you truly live. Culture can only realize their further richness by honoring their tradition. And only by respecting nature, life uh, can uh, nature natural life can humanity continue to exist and uh, this is beautiful because we need to start understanding that in the past we were basically just like going fast not caring about each other um not being even aware about ourselves so now more than anything post covid um people are understanding that this is a very important um thing uh, to all of us and local production fits perfectly in this so i wrote benefits on local production uh the first thing is that we have job opportunities we give job opportunities to that community okay uh we ensure through job opportunities we ensure wealth to the community um and then because of that wealth we ensure also more education and from that education uh we actually tend it's not just education of two plus two is four it's also education on um human rights um then like it's not a secret that women usually tend to be uh more discriminated in many societies so also through that education you educate women that they are not less and that they have human rights. And there is a very interesting project that Timberland has been working on since 1992 and 1992, and we're going to see it afterwards. Um, but it's exactly about that, like teaching women that they have rights as, as human beings. And I actually did it as a spiral because local production can just bring positive things. If any of you has been in the past, um, have been in the past talks, usually uh, we've been writing like pros and cons. And in local production, I need to say that there's no cons. There's only positive things. Uh, it's not that like everything has also negative things, but in here it's just like so many positive ones. That that's basically what uh, I think we have to enhance uh local production is also working with minorities uh so and like discriminated groups so for example made in petare is a venezuelan brand of course i am from venezuela so i wanted to highlight this one i think it's uh it's a beautiful project and uh, basically they work the idea is to uh feed kids from the slum Petare is the second biggest slum in the entire Latin America. It's the biggest slum in Venezuela and is one of the most dangerous in the entire world. Uh, the rates on criminality are extremely high. And um, so it's a beautiful project because the idea is that they feed the kids through all of the, um, like through the, the bags they manage to sell. But the bags are made by the moms. So they train these mothers to stitch, and then they have an e-commerce. You can buy it online. They're not expensive. They're around forty to sixty dollars each first. So it's a beautiful project because also through this, through more wealth, um, like there, there's to put, like the idea is that then there is also less criminality because most of this. Um, 
most of this criminality is coming from hunger. Uh, Venezuela has a minimum wage of $2 per month, which is nothing. 95% uh, of the country lives under extreme poorness. So it is extremely important that we give opportunities to these people uh, to work in a different way and so that the kids don't have to be prostitutes or but not not that don't have to uh but it's something very normal uh it's common unfortunately so that's also what we mean about local production now i have this um beautiful brand called original madras uh i think Trustan is in here yes Trustan is in here so original madras i'm mm. going to um Hassan, yeah, you unmuted yourself. Thank you very much for joining. Uh, I'm going to give a brief explanation and then you can um, continue. Uh, but Original Madras is made in India and it's all handwoven, it's cotton. Um, they're giving uh, job opportunities to this artisan making this fabric. And uh, now, Hassan, please explain us a bit about Original Madras. And if you want to turn your camera on, go ahead. Sure. I'm having a few Wi-Fi issues here, which might ruin the audio. So I'm going to try and do this without video for now. But um, thank you for having me, Diana, and including me in this PowerPoint as well. Um, I'll give you guys a quick introduction. And obviously, if you have questions, let me know. But like Diana said, this is a completely hand-woven line. Um, the company itself is based between New York and Madras. And my family, um, it was started by my grandfather 50 years ago. It's actually a family business. And the family business used to be manufacturing clothes for other brands. And it still continues to be our family business. But a couple months ago, um, we came up with this idea to start our own line. And specifically, Madras is the city where I'm based, which is today called Chennai. But in the fashion world, it's also known for the Madras checks which became very famous in the early 70s um, with brands like Ralph Lauren, Tommy Hilfiger, J. Crew, etc. And traditionally, Madras, the fabric, used to be woven in Madras on hand looms. And this was 50, 60, 70 years ago. And everything you see in the market today, unfortunately, or fortunately, whichever way you want to look at it, is all machine loom. And more recently, is not even made in Madras anymore. So the community of weavers that used to weave this is unfortunately a dying community. And my family and my team and I wanted to revive that community. And so what we did is we went out, um, we found different weavers in different clusters and we set up hand looms in my family, family's 50 year old factory here in Madras. And we've decided to weave the entire collection on the hand looms. And so therefore the name, the original Madras Trading Company, and we actually launched in Pitti in Florence in June, which is when I met Diana after a very, very long time. And we are officially in stores as of March. Uh, very unfortunate timing with COVID-19. But I still feel positive in that, you know, it's very much the opposite fast fashion in that it's very slow. The weaver can only weave 16 meters over a week, which is only five shirts. And on a machine, you can do that in 10 minutes. And so, you know, it's quite exciting. The line is small, but I think it really speaks to a more conscious customer. And I think it's very relevant to the conversation we're having. And so that's my quick introduction. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you, Prasan. Um, actually, it's very interesting that you're um, saying this thing. Of, like, I wrote it down uh, because it's amazing that you said it, that this, they can make 16 meters in one week. Because uh, if I, I received a question uh, like one or two weeks ago, and this mm -hmm. girl was, uh, do you think like that sustainable fashion will be as uh, cheap as fast fashion someday? And um, this is exactly the result I said, like, you know, like if we want to actually pay well these people, uh, it's impossible mm -hmm. to, um, to actually make it cheap because 16 meters in one week is nothing. It's five shirts. I mean, if you actually want to have exactly. a big match, you need to have thousands of weavers. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree. And 
that's what we're trying to do here is, you know, I feel like every, everybody should have a Madras check shirt, but maybe you don't need to have 20 Madras check shirts that you bought for $20, you know? And so I think this is sort of that happy middle that we found. And even for me personally, I know a lot of you are uh, based in Italy, if not from Italy, is I feel like um, for product that's made in Italy or made in France, people are willing to pay a premium for it. And I think that's fair because there are certain things the Italians or the French make that the rest of the world cannot make. But I feel the same way about um, textiles that are from India. And so I think it's very odd that you would buy a Madras check shirt made in Portugal or made in Bangladesh when it is from Madras. And so, you know, we're not trying to do flannel shirts or indigos. We're trying to do something that we know and that's from our community. And I think there is sustainability in what it is we're trying to do because we're not just um, trying to sustain a community. We're trying to sustain a craft. And I think, I think there's something there. Yeah. Yeah. That's actually beautiful. And uh, what you're mm -hmm. saying exactly true i mean like italians and french of course they've made their fame for doing like high quality things and unfortunately mm -hmm. this country such as india or china that they actually like the origins is craftsmanship but since exactly. the, the workforce is so cheap that like mm -hmm. to everyone it turned out just to be like ah oh, it's just like you know cheap stuff but this is beautiful and this is handmade and this is much more well, I, I mean, it's not much more than an Italian artisan. It's just the same. It's, it's the same level. Right. Exactly. And it's about creating awareness. I mean, you have a beautiful storytelling in here. Thank you very much. Yeah, and I completely agree what you said in terms of production as well. I mean, I'm stuck in India during this whole pandemic. Um, I usually shuttle back and forth between New York and India. And, you know, I got back from the factory today, two hours ago. And some of the workers have been there longer than my father has been in the business. And so, you know, we have these communities that have worked with us and have grown together with us. And I think the stereotype that India is a place of cheap manufacturing, I think that needs to change. And we're doing whatever we can, whether it's even 0.001% of people's minds that we can change. I think it's worth all the hard work. Of course. Also because I think that that little, uh, like, feeding effect is much bigger than actually having like a big community mm -hmm. where you can actually follow personally everyone. Um, and right. I also read something for Sam, uh, and I wanted to, to ask you, but A, your mm -hmm. company is all 100% from India, so that is part of local production, you know, when we see, and that's like an information to all of you, but when we see always this thing of like mm -hmm. made in France or made in India, you know, usually materials are coming from another part of the world. So that's, that's a lot of um, carbon emissions we're making to travel from point A to point B uh, to make the cotton arrive mm -hmm. from Peru to Italy and then produce it and then from Italy to the US. So it's actually amazing that you're having the cotton made in India. Uh, I don't know if you can, do you have anything mm -hmm. about, can you trace it? And I also know, so I make the question when you say everything all together, that um, you mm -hmm. use indigo, which is originally from India. So that's the only natural dyeing you're using, mm -hmm. right? I, I didn't get the last part, Diana. Sorry, what was it about the dyes? I also read you don't use natural dyeing except from indigo, right? Exactly, correct, yes. Exactly. So, and indigo is actually originally yeah. from India. So, also another thing on the local production is that you're actually getting cotton from India. The manufacturing is in India. Exactly. Uh, the design is from mm -hmm. the clay, mm -hmm. and the indigo is from India. So, can you please tell us a bit about this? Yeah, absolutely. So, to be honest, because we're a very new brand, I wish I could show off a lot more about transparency but it's something we're working on. And because we're small and the numbers aren't quite that large yet, we typically just buy yarn from, from suppliers over here. We don't really have the transparency of which farm was the cotton grown farm, which is where we got the yarn from. We hope to get to that level over the next few years as we grow and build. But yes, all the yarn that we, we get is from cotton supplied and sourced in local farms here in India. And as much as possible, we even try to keep it as local as 
to the city of Madras because as you guys can appreciate, India is a very, very large country. So getting something from Delhi in the north is like getting something from Poland to Italy. You know, it still goes through a lot of carbon emissions before it actually gets to you. And so as much as possible, we try to source everything locally, even the trims, the buttons, the accessories, absolutely everything that we can. So, and hopefully over time, we're able to source, you know, whether it's organic yarn, whether it's working with the farmers directly and knowing exactly where your cotton comes from, but baby steps for the time being. Yeah. Of course. Amazing. Well, baby steps are the mm -hmm. best thing you're starting. <sighs> Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Prof. Yes. Thank you. If Thank has, you. Thank. If anyone has questions for Prof, you can write them down on the chat, and uh, then Prof can uh, answer them. Um, so, uh, aside from uh, original Madras, Madras, sorry, um, there's. I wanted to speak about this project. This is actually my project. It's called Borseggi. Uh, we teach detainees in a male jail in Milan to stitch. So I am actually the person in charge of the training and of the production we do. We have an in-house uh, production and we also have, we are 70 um, in total. Well, we are, it means that there are 70 detainees and then it's me. And um, there, some of them, they work from outside from jail, and some of them in the laboratory we have in-house. Uh, also because some of them, they finish they, their, their um, how do you say, the, the thing in jail, <laughs> the La Pena, I don't know how to say that in English, sorry. Um, but uh, now they're free, and uh, the truth is that in order for them to reintegrate in society is very difficult also because companies uh, when they see your CV and they see that you've been in jail for 20 or 30 years uh, that's of course not a very good uh, asset to your CV so what we do is that we train them we start working with them and then they have also the possibility to continue after that um, we don't just work on our own brand in here I put two pictures this is Etro uh, Etro is an Italian brand for those who don't know it and basically they gave us all of the scraps from the um, uh, ties they produced and uh, with them we made all of this patchwork uh, for bed sheets. So it's a, it's a very beautiful project not just because we're training the pennies to stitch and we're giving them job opportunities but we're also using uh, fabrics that otherwise uh, would be just trash. So it's this thing on like local production. It's like an Italian company giving us that we're in Milan. They're in Milan as well. So they give us the product, um, the fabric, the scraps, and we produce everything and we distribute everything in Milan. So because this project is very small, so everything remains very, very local. And uh, with this, I wanted to take a time to make a comparison between local production and fast fashion just to see very like clearly the the difference between one another local production is ethical it's slow it's empowering and it's culture preservation empowering because uh for example in the case of original madras but also in the case of detainees and the women in the garden um you're actually empowering this minorities or groups in difficulty because I mean minority for example detainees just my the jail I work in uh, I work with there are 2,500 detainees so it's not a very little group um, and it's just one jail out of four in Milan uh, however they are um, groups of people with difficulty because otherwise they wouldn't actually have the possibility to work and it is extremely important to give them uh, a job opportunity because otherwise once they go out they would basically be forced to do the same they were doing before um, and uh, that is the typical discussion I actually have with people um, some in a good way and some in a bad way but they're like you know if they are if they murdered someone why would we give them an opportunity and it's exactly that 
A, we all deserve an opportunity. Uh, B, if we don't give them an opportunity, then the chance that they start committing the same crimes uh, are very high. So it is extremely important that we actually start understanding the importance on, of this project. Uh, so it's empowering because, I mean, also right now during COVID, for example, all of my detainees were doing masks for the entire jail. They made 20,000 masks and uh, they became basically the cool ones in jail. Like everyone was like, they, their personality got so much bo boosted, you know, like at the beginning, they wouldn't work that much if I was not there. Like they would feel lost. Right now they feel like, oh my God, you know, like we know how to do stuff. Um, so, I mean, it's amazing and it's empowering uh, and it's culture preservation, uh, not in the case of jail, of course, but in the case, for example, of Madras, uh, or if we work with um, Mayan women, uh, that's culture preservation. Fast fashion on the other side is usually unethical. Uh, unfortunately, it is true, usually big uh, companies working in the fast fashion, they're they care about everything but ethics. Uh, they don't care if they put the chemicals in a river. They don't care if people have to work extra hours and not being paid for them. They don't care if they're working on a place without enough windows. They don't care if they don't eat um, at, at the time they have to eat, if they're not well paid. So usually this is a big problem. Uh, fast fashion is extremely fast, extremely fast. And um, well, that's why it's called fast fashion, but it's not a good thing. Uh, not always a good thing. Um, I know we are all constantly willing to have new things and oh, the new iPhone is out and uh, Zara is putting clothes every two weeks in the store. So now I want to actually have the dress I saw on Instagram or oh my God, this leaves like puffy sleeves are so beautiful, but they're so expensive if I go to Gucci. So I mean, there's so funny between between Gucci and Zara, no? But um, so then you just want to go to Zara and buy it. Uh, but the truth is that we should be a bit more like grounded, and we don't need we don't need it all, you know. Uh, so it's extremely fast, and I think that is driving us crazy. Uh, it's degrading because if you go to factories um, where mass 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 fashion is being produced. Um, and you see the way these people are working, it's just sad. It's like one bathroom for 200 people, uh, one like on the side of the other, it's, it's just bigger daily. It's, it's very, it's not a pretty reality. And uh, though it's not pretty, it's important to point it out to know that we have, it's, it's our choice. And uh, if we decide not to live in that way, Brands will understand it and they will have, they will be obliged to shift. And uh, culture destruction in the sense that, uh, China, China, for example, it's a craft, uh, it's a craftsman co uh, country since always. They make beautiful craft, like amazing. And, uh, by, just by the fact that we're using China to do the fastest things on earth, then we're not actually using the good things they can give us. So um, in fast fashion, there's everything but culture, something super important to take into consideration. Um, so the times are changing and due to the increasing uh, of like the huge amount of production in these emerging countries, and in here I just named a few of them, so India, China, Pakistan, Indonesia, Vietnam, many countries in Latin America, um, this because of cheap labor and also proximity to raw materials. So for example, in Peru, the cotton. Um, so there's been a really big pressure on corporate social responsibility. And this is what I was speaking at the beginning. So there are a lot of uh, companies that, yeah, so I'm, I, our headquarters are in France, but we produce in India. And in France, everyone is perfectly like, well paid, the company is beautiful, the offices are amazing, everything is perfect, and then in India it's just like trash, who cares? So actually there's been a lot of pressure on this, 
And that's why the United Nations created this Protect, Respect, and Remedy Framework, which is actually to extend this right to the other countries. Um, so basically, this um, Protect, Respect, and Remedy Framework is more like to give employees, A, the chance to be free, no discrimination. More than anything, we need gender uh, and uh, religion-wise. So it's not like, oh, you're black, so you're getting paid this, or you're Muslim, so you're getting paid that, you're a Jew, so you're... So this is one of the most important things about Protect, Respect, and Remedy, um, and remedy Framework. Uh, then the, the gender equality, uh, they can, they are free to express themselves. They can also do groups within the, like, or communities within the company just to have, or hobbies or something in common. So, uh, and this was just made in 2008. So everything is quite new, let's say, uh, but it's extremely important because this is happening. And thanks to also this happening, uh, we get in this very important topic, which is grass roots innovation. So grassroots innovation is community lead solutions that respond to the local situation and the interests and values of local communities involved. And why do I put it here? Because that's local production. We want to preserve the um, culture and tradition of the area. Extremely important. And so in here I have one example of Patagonia. Patagonia actually they are huge donators for this kind of project. In uh, this case, there is this um, dam that uh, was built in, the four, in 1942, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, it was made for electricity and uh, other stuff, but it's not in use uh, since like 20 years, 25 years. And due to this, all the fauna basically died in the river. And uh, so they started, this is why they made this scissor. The process was like, okay, let's cut this. It's absolutely unnecessary. And uh, so they've been working on this. They cut part of the, of the dam, but not all of it. And just by doing that, they started seeing that the fauna was restoring. And uh, this quote, um, I read it on Let My People Go Surfing, which is from the um, founder of Patagonia. Uh, a grassroots effort could make a difference and degraded habitat could with effort be restored. And uh, they, well, in this specific case, they haven't managed to, to take it down. It would be the biggest uh, dam, uh, demolition in the entire California. Uh, so it's a very big project. They've raised more than $200 million for uh, destroying it. Um, and uh, just, for example, to them, Patagonia is an extremely sustainable company. For example, if you want to go surfing in the middle of the break, you can. If you feel that you want to go climb, they have a climbing gym in the headquarters. So uh, they do care a lot about their people enjoying, having fun, um, having some free time, quality time. So for example, in this river, they could surf. And to them, the most important thing is like, you know, it's, this, is, this is nature, we, we have to preserve it. Um, and after five years, actually like a lot of fish and salmon um, were coming out again. So very beautiful. Another grassroots innovation uh, that I mentioned a bit at the beginning is from Timberland, this one I love. Timberland has an NGO which is called CARE and uh, they uh, partner up with Mamata. The Timberland, they have the, the biggest part of production in Timberland is in Bangladesh. And uh, they realized, this is 1992, 1992, so long ago. Um, basically they realized that women in Bangladesh were very discriminated. And in the entire world, 85% of the production is made by women in the fashion industry. So it's extremely important if they're being discriminated, they're basically, their entire workers are being discriminated. Um, 
so they decided to run a um, survey in the entire country just to understand women, you know, like what, uh, what they knew about their human rights. And they realized that most of women in, in Bangladesh, they were suffering, they were facing domestic violence, harassment, rape, and torture. And most of these women, they didn't even know they had human rights, of course, because this became basically a culture, not a good one, but it became part of it. So if their husband would rape them, so then it was normal. Maybe because the mom even said, told her, like, this is normal. This is the way we do it. So the, like, care NGO said, like, okay, so we're going to make something to help these women. So basically, they created this uh, program where they uh, do, like, study groups, and they raise awareness among women about their social rights. They go to study every week about what are their social rights, what can they do if they have any problem, what, how can they solve them. Then they also have a medical fund to assist low-income workers. And uh, they have microfinance facilities for their employees. And it can be for studying, for healthcare, or for business initiatives. So uh, the numbers, I don't have them right now with me, but it's really pretty because um, they were writing like all, like all of the numbers. It's more than 800,000 uh, people that have actually got something out of this microfinance. Either it's for doing a barber shop or for getting a surgery you need or for paying university for your kids. So more than 800,000 people have had access to this. And it, if I'm not mistaken, it was $2.6 million that has been actually given in in, in for this microfinance um, project. So it's amazing. Uh, we're helping uh, the local community and uh, they're like, more than helping the local, like if you help, you will be helped as well. If you have a healthy community, they will be super happy to come work. They will never get sick. They will be super happy to do, to do one extra hour or to spend the, the, I don't know, maybe Sunday if they have to. So it's, it's a very important thing to do. And uh, with this, I just would like to wrap it up with this made in uh, label. And uh, just the, the made in is just a branding thing, okay? So it's very important for us as consumers to start understanding where we are getting our things from. When it says made in Italy, it doesn't matter if it's made in Italy and the fabrics have to travel from five different countries just to make one collection. It's made in Italy because it was assembled at the end, but it is extremely important to know where the materials are coming from. In the fashion industry at the moment, we have just control over the first tires which is final production and the materials materials raw mat um, yeah not, not even raw materials but like suppliers but we don't have any um, traceability on or not any but usually we don't have traceability on parts components and raw materials which is a very big problem we're having um, super important ask always sorry where do you source your materials uh do you have any certification and i wanted to close with this quote which i love which is each brand we buy it's a vote on the planet we want to live in um so uh this is for us as consumers for us as future brand owners uh super important that we become influencers of what we want to see and uh how we would like to be treated as well. Um, with this, I would like to thank you very much, uh, all of you, to, uh, for having joined today. Uh, to know more about sustainability, you can always um, add us on Instagram, follow us on Instagram in Diana Janis underscore consulting. And I don't know if any of you have questions, I would be happy to thank you, Preston. Uh, to to reply to to all of you. If you have no questions at the moment, you can always 
write me on Instagram and I'm always happy to to interact with you and reply to all of your questions. Um, so, well, since nobody's writing questions, I will wrap it up. Thank you again and hope to see you soon. Thank you guys.